to worship on this Palm Sunday as we begin the Holy Week journey together. We're so glad that you are here with us now and we pass the peace of Christ to you and invite you to light a candle as we begin worshiping together. Join me responsibly in a reading of Psalm 118. Give thanks to God for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say, his love endures forever. The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. God has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Blessed is he who comes in the name of God. From the house of God, we bless you. God is God, and he has made his light shine upon us. With palm boughs in hand, join in the procession up to the altar. You are my God, and I will give you thanks. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to God, for he is good. His love endures forever. Amen. This is the first day of Holy Week, the biggest week of the church year. It's on this Sunday that our focus narrows from the broad themes of self-reflection, almsgiving, and fasting during Lent to experience the journey of Christ now. Holy Week invites us to put ourselves in Jesus' shoes, to experience his journey to the cross, and to ask ourselves what this journey means to us. Holy Week always starts with Palm Sunday, one of the most beautiful experiences Jesus has on earth, as he's welcomed into Jerusalem with a palm parade, the only time in his earthly ministry that he's recognized as king. I imagine that the story that we're focusing on today happens right before Jesus enters into Jerusalem, right before the palm parade, where people cry out, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. So listen now 
to our scripture reading for today from John chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, Leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. This is the word of the Lord. Two months ago, I was as close to my own death as I have been in my life so far. Severe pain in my abdomen landed me in the emergency room. By the time my intake and time in the waiting room concluded, I was back in a small examination room, waiting for the doctor to come, and I was feeling a lot better. The pain that had me on my knees at home had receded and was almost completely gone, which made me feel silly for going to the ER and wasting the doctor's time. And so as I watched the clock strike midnight, I was sure that I was fine and that I should just go home. The doctor that night disagreed with me and set me on a course for five hours of testing in the middle of the night that led to a diagnosis of ovarian cancer, likely stage three or stage four, the doctor told me. In an instant, the plans I had been making for my life were upended by thoughts of my own death. As a pastor, I am well acquainted with illness and death. I've sat with so many who have gotten news like this so I knew that this diagnosis could be very serious for me and my family. And all of a sudden, for what I realized was the first time in my life, I could not ignore the truth that death is inevitable and that one day I really will die. There's something that changes when we become aware that we will one day die. Something happens when that knowledge moves from our head down into our gut. As many of you know, it turned out that the large tumors in my abdomen were actually stage four endometriosis. But there were three weeks that the doctors were positive I had cancer, which led me to reevaluate all the big plans I had made in an instant and to have new plans replace them. Plans for a surgery and a recovery I wasn't planning for Plans for covering my duties at work and taking care of our children. Plans to live in the moment finally, to write notes to everybody I love and to savor what was right in front of me because that was all I knew I had. In the first few days of thinking I had cancer, I said to my husband, Brian, all of a sudden in an instant, I feel like nothing matters and everything matters at the same time. I imagine that this was how Jesus and Lazarus and Mary and Martha must have felt in the story we just read. This story of a dinner party is sandwiched in the Gospel of John between two deaths. The death of Lazarus on the one hand and the death of Jesus on the other. Not more than a handful of days before this dinner party took place, Lazarus was pronounced dead. He had been gravely ill. And Mary and Martha knew that without some sort of miracle, he would die. So they sent a friend to go and find Jesus, who they felt was their only hope at saving their brother. Now, Jesus was doing ministry, important things, when this news came. He was surrounded by crowds and tending to people, and he told this messenger that he would go and see Lazarus as soon as he could. And he asked the messenger to tell Mary and Martha not to worry that the kind of illness that Lazarus had would not lead to death. But by the time Jesus arrives to see Lazarus, he has already been dead for four days. 
Jesus brings Lazarus back to life, and he does so for the sake of building the faith of all those who would witness this miracle and those would hear, who would hear about him being raised from the dead. And Jesus raises him by going to his tomb, and in the name of God, he invites Lazarus to come out of the tomb. And Lazarus walks out, a real-life dead man walking. He comes out of his tomb, his burial clothes are unraveling behind him, the stench of death is still surrounding him, and Jesus asks those that are there and see this to unbind him and set him free because he's alive. So this dinner gathering is to celebrate the new life that Lazarus had been given. A week past Lazarus' death and a week before Jesus' death, they are together sharing a meal, giving thanks for what God has done. So Martha is preparing the meal as she does. Judas is trying to catch anyone he can in doing wrong, as he does. Lazarus is there, but doesn't say a word, likely still in shock to have experienced death and to now be alive. And Mary does the very strangest thing of all. Mary finds a clay jar of perfume and brings it to the dinner table. Now, this is not the kind of perfume that you put on when you're going out for the night. This is the kind of perfume that was reserved for bodily preparation after death. Perhaps it was left over from the oil that was purchased when Mary and Martha prepared Lazarus' body for burial. Mary takes this jar of oil. She kneels down beside Jesus at the table. She takes down her hair and anoints Jesus' feet with this oil, then drying his feet with her hair. Everyone is shocked. Can you even imagine a scene like this? This incredibly intimate and loving act immediately makes others uncomfortable. It makes me uncomfortable even reading about it. I can't imagine what it felt like to be there firsthand experiencing it. This radical act of love interrupts this meal, a party that's being held in someone else's honor. It replaces the smells of dinner with the smells of burial and end of life. This moment of celebrating that, Je that Lazarus is alive is turned into a moment of realizing that Jesus is going to die. Now, Judas sees this act of radical love and tries to present himself as holier than this messy scene. He says to them, why are you wasting this expensive oil on Jesus' feet? This oil could have been sold and the money could have been given to the poor. Jesus, defender of the poor, the one who has been pressing all to love each other, especially when it pushes us outside of our comfort zones, disagrees with Judas and he says to him, leave her alone. The poor will always be with you, but I will not. Now, while Judas is technically right about the oil, he is missing the point of this act of love. It's easy to miss the point at first when an act of love like this is so jarring, so uncomfortable, so beautiful and extravagant. But the point of this story isn't found through reasonable logic. The point of this story is to give us a tangible example of what extraordinary love looks like. This act of love is the kind of love Jesus had been proclaiming from the beginning of his ministry. This is a reflection of God's love, love that can't be boxed in by right actions performed at just the right moment, the kind of love that isn't best understood by reading a long list of rules and regulations. This is an act of love that's transformational at its very core. It transforms the giver, it transforms the receiver, and it transforms all who witness it. The Gospel of John takes the old phrase, seeing is believing, and turns it upside down. John uses the word believing 10 times more often than the other Gospel writers, and two times more often than Paul. It's in John's gospel where we see Jesus say, believe in God and believe also in me. 
Jesus says, believe in the light so that you may become children of the light. And he says, don't just believe in me because you've seen me. Blessed are those who believe even when they haven't seen. This belief that Jesus talks about is not an intellectual pursuit. It's not about well-crafted creeds or coming up with a set of complex and complete rules to live by, but the belief that Jesus talks about in John is always a verb. To believe is to live out your faith through your actions. Belief and action are never separated in John's gospel. Now, theologians throughout time have tried to parse out what Mary really believed. In all the accounts of Mary's presence in the Gospels, she never explains who Jesus is with her words, and she doesn't claim even what she thinks about God. Instead, Mary consistently lives out her beliefs through loving actions. She believes by sitting and staying still at Jesus' feet as he teaches She believes by running to Jesus first when her brother has died and he comes to visit. And she believes as she lovingly and lavishly anoints Jesus' feet in the days before his death, preparing him for what is to come. Our Lenten journey this year has been an immersion in this kind of belief and love. Each week, We've tried to define what love looks like in action. We've said love looks like forgiveness. It looks like serving. Love looks like inclusion and empathy. And love looks like sacrifice. And this Holy Week, we will take the final journey to love lived out through action. The love we'll experience this week is shared around a table with bread, and a cup. The love we'll experience this week will be poured into a wash basin by the Son of God to wash the feet of his closest followers in preparation for the journey they would soon face. It's the kind of love that's lived out boldly as Jesus carries his own cross, the instrument of his death, to the hill where he will eventually die. And the love we will experience this holy week will cost something. It's the kind of love that is so hard to bear at times that Peter will deny the one he loves the most, not once, but three times. This love makes us uncomfortable. It so deeply desires to uproot institutions that oppress others that Judas becomes so uncomfortable that he rejects it and turns on Jesus to betray him in hopes of getting power. And ultimately, at the end of the week, this love will be so heartbreaking that Jesus will weep in anticipation of what is to come, and then he will die to show us how committed he is to God's transformational love. And maybe what will be most shocking of all this week is that Jesus will also ask us to do the same. Mary's radical and gorgeous act of love feels inappropriate to us because we like love we can control. Giving away love isn't easy, and receiving God's love can be just as hard. But Mary doesn't try to tell us about love with a well-crafted sermon or five suggestions of how to live in loving ways. Mary simply shows us how to do love, how to put love into action. She does this by listening to the Holy Spirit who guides her to anoint Jesus' feet with this oil. Mary does this by sacrificing something that was worth something to her, this expensive burial perfume. Mary shows us how to live out love by interrupting dinner plans to give Jesus a gift that will fill him with love as he heads into what will be the hardest week of his life. So this week, this holy week, 
Mary's example of radical belief as seen through loving actions will be our guide. This Holy Week, we too are being called to put our belief and love into action. So first, may we take time this week with God to ponder what love looks like in our own context now. Jesus gave us a hint about the shape that love and action should take by reminding us to feed his sheep, by asking us to care for the orphans and the widows, by showing us how to root out oppression wherever it lives, and by welcoming that one lost sheep back home. Next, as we ponder, we do this with God, and it, our pondering guides us into action. May we not get paralyzed by the thought of doing love right. May we instead follow Mary's lead and follow Jesus' lead to live out love moment by moment and day by day by simply just taking the right next step as God leads. I don't think Mary woke up the morning of that dinner party thinking, I'm going to anoint Jesus' feet with oil tonight. I think Mary simply responded to the moment listening to God and to the Holy Spirit's nudge in her heart to care for her friend, Jesus. And so the last way that we can do love now is living into the awareness that we don't have all the time in the world. Death will come. It is inevitable. Ultimately, we can't avoid it and we won't be able to escape it. But the reality that we too will die someday just might be the key to living love fully now. So happy Holy Week. Let the journey of transformational love begin as we journey with Christ together. Amen. It was grace that brought me here Though the way was never clear I could hear you calling me You were always near It was grace that brought me here Through the fathom the fathoms of my sin while the storm was gathering you whispered in my ear it was grace that brought me here The strength to fight you said you believed in me washed away my fears it was grace that brought me here kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive
forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It was grace that brought me here Though the way was never clear In my constant wandering You were always near It was grace It was grace It was Nothing but your grace, your grace. This Holy Week, we invite you to take the journey of the cross with us. It begins on Monday, Thursday with a tenebrae service at noon and another at 6.30 p.m. in our sanctuary. On Good Friday, you're welcome to come to the building to experience our outdoor self-guided prayer pilgrimage at a time that works best for you. And on Easter Sunday, we have four worship options for you to choose from. Sunrise service at 6.30 a.m. at Wyzetta Beach, 8 a.m. communion service in the chapel, and worship in the sanctuary at 9 and 10.30 a.m. Please visit our website to RSVP for any of these worship options. As we've walked together through COVID, we wanna thank you for joining us for online worship. It has been a time of learning and growth for all of us. And as we transition to in-person gatherings, starting Easter Sunday, our online format will change. We'll be live streaming services from our sanctuary at 9 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. And Parables will continue to worship online through the end of May. So now, as we go together into Holy Week, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit guide the way. For what does the Lord require of us but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. Amen. Go in peace. I'm just a poor wayfaring stranger traveling through This world of woe There is no sickness Toil or danger In that bright land to which I go. I'm going home to see my I'm going home never more to roam I'm just 
just going over, oh, over Jordan. I'm just going, going, going. Ooh.